Okay, thanks very much for the invitation. I must say it's always hard to follow as a biologist, a philosopher uh, uh, in a talk, but you made such a strong argument for digital feudalism just now that I think uh, we are entirely in line. And we all know that we are basically, by downloading smartphone apps for free, we're giving away data, we are giving our profiles away to Google, to Facebook, and I'm sure Google knows more about your health at the moment than your doctor does already now. And so this digital feudalism is going to increase dramatically. While we pay for coffee here outside in the restaurant, no question, we never think of paying for a digital service we pay with our data, right? And that has led in the last 10 years to this sort of digital dependency. I only realized this when 10 years ago, as a geneticist, I'm interested in genome. Your genome is unique. Every one of you has a unique genome. It consists of 6 billion letters of code. This is the biological language, and each of us differs in one in a thousand of these letters. That's all the difference there is. And see the difference in faces and, and, and statues, etc. that uh, has a lot to do with what is in our genome. And understanding how these small differences translate into the phenotypic differences that we see, how we react to drugs, to medications, etc. that is really a challenge. And that is a challenge that actually needs a lot of people, data from a lot of people. So, in 2008, I got really excited by the call of 23andMe, this Google spin-off company, who said, you as a citizen scientist can participate with your genome data to understanding disease. And this is my family, and so in 2008, I offered them as a Christmas present their genome analysis. Has any one of you analyzed their genome here? None. So, well, I've got news for you. In five to ten years, all of you will have your genome sequenced fully because the next time you go to the, uh, to the hospital, there is so much information about how you respond to drugs that the doctor will, uh, will order this, and it's going to be much cheaper than an MRI. It now costs about $1,000. The, the, the version I did costed about $200 at the time. But what I realized is that I'm giving my genome data away to this for-profit company, and they're making lots and lots of money. They're making hundred millions uh, deals with pharmaceutical company based on our data. And I said, well, it's not only genome data, it's all the fitness data, etc. How can we reconcile that? Is there not a better way to manage our data? Shouldn't we not make the profits as a society? Not we as an individual, but as a society. And you see this beautiful beach, it's not where I was on, uh, on vacation this summer, but I'd like to take this beach as an image for, say, global public health, for example. To understand public health and to describe this be beach in detail, you have to know all the sand grains. And the sand grains are each of us with all our data, genome data, medical history, etc. Now, the beach doesn't change if your data set is not there. So each sand grain in itself is irrelevant, but it's the sum of all the sand grains that makes the beach, and the sum is society, and so the profits should not go to the shareholders of these companies, but they should go back also to society. And that is sort of where the cooperative, citizen-owned cooperative approach comes about. And this is only going to be going to be worse, because now artificial intelligence is going to be much more, much more strongly involved in diagnostics, not only in medicine, also in education, etc. And those companies or those countries that have the most data will have the lead. And there was a New York Times article last year saying that the global dominance of China and the US in artificial intelligence is such that every local hospital in Germany will have to subscribe to AI diagnostic services. So how can we get out of this? And I think we have a chance because we have the right to control our own data. And if we find a way to combine not only the way we deal with our data, 
but actually that we as individuals with our supercomputers engage in this, in a fair data governance, I think we have a chance to sort of uh, break this global dominance. And I will tell you how we are approaching this. Because it goes down to three features that personal data have that are unique. They're called a new value or a new asset or the oil of the 21st century. First of all, they can easily be copied. Your doctor has to keep your record for 10 years, but you can get a copy of that. At least in Switzerland, you're allowed to. They can easily be copied, and I can do with a copy what I want. Secondly, it's an asset that's uniquely equally distributed amongst people. Because in genome data alone, we're all billionaires. I told you we have six billion letters in our genome. And that is true for every woman in Tanzania and every woman in Ghana as well. And the number of steps we take, the number of heartbeats we have, it's an entity that is very similarly distributed in contrast to money and all the other resources, uh, values that we have. And thirdly, and most importantly, you are the maximal aggregator of your data. Google knows a lot about you, but Google does not have your medical record, and it cannot have your medical record until, unless you send it to them. It does not have your genome, because that's probably then stored in the hospital. But you have a right to combine all these data together. And it is the combination of different data sets on the individual that is where the value is. So we, by, cop, by generating an ecosystem of these data copies under the individual's control, we can actually gen, generate much more value and insight than the companies can do now. And here is the great thing of GDPR. May 25th was a milestone in the empowerment of the individual. And very few people realized Article 20, read it in the GDPR, says data portability. Every citizen has the right to a digital copy of all his or her personal data. That's data portability. That's in there that can be enforced to get a copy of your Facebook record, of your medical record, of your genome record, and aggregate it. Now, obviously, you say, this is too complicated. What can I do with this? But this is, think about it. In the Middle Ages, people thought, the feudal lords thought, we cannot give our serfs money for a salary because they don't know how to handle this. They will go into the next restaurant and spend it all, right? Nowadays, the entire economy works because each of us has a bank account and we spend or invest our money in different ways. And in 10 years from now, we also ha will have, each of us, a personal data account and we will share and invest it the way we want it, for medical research, for whatever. And GDPR allows you to do this, and Mark Zuckerberg already announced that he would be compatible with the European GDPR. Uh, Tim Cook did the same. There is a big drive towards this uh, digital empowerment. And this is not only about uh, medical data. This is our niece, Smila, four years old at the time. Think about your children right now. Do you see what she's doing? This is not a posted picture, this is a real picture. She's playing on an iPad. Every swipe this Smilla does from now on until she's 18 or 20 and maybe considering coming to ETH for a study is recorded somewhere. And she is profiled with Khan Academy, with Coursera, but with every game that she does, any, someone profiles her. That's the reality now, that's true for every of your children. If she has a copy of all these data together in her data account, she will have an education profile, again, a maximal aggregator because she has kindergarten, uh, elementary school, and high school in there as well, that is much more detailed than the notes or the grades she has in the exams or in the final, uh, in the final diploma. So personal data, personal education data will result in personalized education much in the same way that we talk about personal medicine now. Very few people talk about that. 
So, but the opportunity is that we can actually engage in this process with the copies of our data. This is the blue square represents these two billion hours that people watch television in the United States per year, two billion hours. Now, you see the little square, very, very small, is 100 million hours that it took to build Wikipedia. That's what we call the cognitive surplus that is in society. If we engage more in citizen science for any aspect that we, that we like, I think there is a lot we can do. No, no one of us would have thought that Wikipedia could be realized. It has been realized because people want to contribute, they do it, they can correct themselves, and because they don't get financial incentives to, pay, uh, to do it. So I think there is a great surplus. There is actually a human right to do science. These uh, citizen science platforms like Zooniverse show how millions of people contribute to all kinds of tasks, identification of animals or, or patterns, etc. And people want to contribute. They need agency. And they will also redefine science. Because I'm, as a researcher, want you know, maybe your genome data to do a research project. And you say, OK, you can have it, but you will also give it to her because she's my competitor. But you want a solution to your uh, health issue. And I want a publication. So I want exclusive right. That's not in your interest. So I think that will change the way we, we accredit science and how we do science. So the challenge, of course, is how to, do we rebalance this socioeconomic asymmetry in this data-driven uh, economy? And the way we can do it, we go back to these three unique features of personal data. First of all, that data can be easily copied. That it allows us to generate a parallel ecosystem. We don't close down Google. I don't want to close down Google. I don't want to close down Twitter. I like them. But I want to generate a parallel ecosystem under the control of the individual. If we manage these data in these data cooperatives that are not for profit because the, the value should go back to society and not to the individual member, because it's the sand beach, sand grain analogy, but the cooperative is democratically controlled by the one member, one vote. And that fits so well to the fact that we have similar amounts of personal data. And lastly, because we have the greatest aggregation power, this will generate so much value that Facebook will come to us and we will pay for the services like we pay for the coffee outside, but then the data stay under, under our control. So this is not just a concept, we published about this, but it's actually a reality. So Midata is the cooperative that we founded in 2015. Basically, it's a new platform, a cloud-based, secure data storage platform where every record, whether it is your genome, the, the steps that you took today are encrypted individually. It's only you who have the key for that, and you decide with whom you want to share it whether you want to participate in a clinical uh, uh, project or whether you want to download an app that allows you to, to uh, train for, uh, for the Berlin Marathon, for example, using data that stay in your account and that are then not sold. Because the ethics committee that is also uh, elected by the General Assembly is looking at those general terms that the data cannot be sold to third parties. So it will generate an entirely new ecosystem for data services, because data that have never been together, like genome data, medical data, and, and, and shopping data, for example, can now come together. And that, you don't know what to do with it, but there will be hundreds of services that you can use to visualize this data. It will allow you to visualize your digital footprint from all the Facebook tweets and likes you do, and you say, hmm, maybe I should turn down my privacy or turn up my privacy for Facebook, etc. So it will make you literate about data as we have become literate about money by getting pocket money when we were kids. 
So this is not a Swiss thing. Of course, we, we like democracies, we like cooperatives, but this is something that we can do everywhere because the needs of citizens and the patients are the same everywhere. So any application that runs on this Swiss cooperative can also run on a, on a German cooperative. And so these are our co current partners. So we're building, uh, helping them to build Midata cooperatives in Germany, in the Netherlands, Belgium, and in the UK and hopefully also in Ghana, Tanzania, in every country. Because it empowers citizens, it gets the value, and this value, mind you, think about the valuation of Amazon or Google, is huge, because it's already billions now. If you combine it with the data that have not been combined, medical data, it will be much larger. So it will go back to society, and it will be a great source, especially also in low- and middle-income countries. So finally, I think this is the opportunity for Switzerland and Europe to sort of change this uh, digital dependency from these multinational companies. And I also can quote a philosopher, John Rawls, because John Rawls in the 1970s said that the fairest way of a democracy is a property-owning democracy. A property-owning democracy where every citizen not only has a political vote, like in Switzerland, in, in, in Germany, and in the United States, but those that have the money make the largest campaigns. We know it also from Switzerland. But that in addition to the political vote, he or she also has an economic vote. In the 70s, this was called, yeah, you want to have redistribution of wealth. This doesn't work. But now, we have uncovered our personal data as a new asset a new asset that only we can actually maximally control. So we do have a strong economic vote in the future, and that is, I think, a, a way to realize John Rawls' property-owning democracy. And I hope that we in Europe can take the lead here and change this, thanks also to the GDPR. I don't think people who made the data portability article realized what put potential this has for, for the future. Thank you very much for your attention.